I'm going to be speaking tonight, I'm going to be speaking on two topics, uh, and both of these talks are going to be about 45, 50 minutes in length, okay? So you get to hear a lot from me tonight. Uh, there was supposed to be a second speaker tonight, but uh, he wasn't, was not able to make it, and so I said, sure, I can do two if you want. Why not? Um, so I have two topics that I'm going to be talking about, um, and I don't know if some of you have to leave later or that type of thing. Um, so I'm literally going to throw it out to the audience. What do you want to hear about first? So I've got two topics. So the first one is going to be progressive web applications, otherwise known as PWAs. We're going to talk about PWAs in a very general sense about what they are and how do we implement them in vanilla JavaScript. And then we'll be talking about the Angular implementation uh, that's supported uh, in Angular 6 and up. Uh, so that's kind of one topic that we have uh, slated for tonight. And then the other topic is RxJS. So this is reactive programming with JavaScript. Right, so this is going to be more of a hands-on. You're going to clone out a repo, and you're going to you're not going to do any coding, but you're going to be playing around with some code that I've written. You'll be able to see in your browser uh, how things work in RxJS. So we have those two topics. So I don't know how do we decide this. I mean, should we like raise hands or? I mean, I didn't write like an app. I, I suppose I probably should have written like an app, right? And could logged in and voted. I didn't even think about that. Um, who wants to see uh, RxJS first? All right, that's an easy answer. PWAs it is. <laughs> All right, so let's switch over. All right, great. All right, let's get started. So we're going to be talking about progressive web apps uh, with Angular. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, this is my Twitter handle. It's Brian underscore love. You can follow me. I tweet mostly about technology, very little personal stuff. So if you're into Angular and web development, uh, feel free to give me a follow on Twitter. Uh, I'm also a Google developer expert, uh, so this is not a certification. A lot of people ask me what this is, uh, but basically uh, Google recognizes people in the community that are uh, contributing a lot and are really engaged in particular technologies or verticals that uh, Google is in, uh, and they kind of invite you to be a part of this private, uh, I wouldn't say private, but invite you to be a part of this developer group, right? So, uh, so I'm a Google developer expert in Angular and web technologies. Uh, I'm from upstate New York. I like this slide so you guys can get a little bit to know about me. So I usually tell people, like I meet people here in Denver, and they're like, oh, where are you from? Because nobody's from Denver, right? And they're like, where are you from? And I'm like, oh, I'm from New York. And they go, oh, I love New York. And then I go, no, you don't love the New York I'm from. And they're like, what do you mean? I, lo I love New York. It's so great. I'm like, so this is New York City. A little geography before we get started. There's a state, OK? It's one of 50, one of the lower 48. I'm from this area. Do you notice that there's not even a highway near where I'm from? OK, so that's where I'm from. So when I tell you, oh, I'm from New York, don't think tall buildings and concrete. Think like Ireland. So my dad actually worked for Corning Incorporated as a physicist for 30 years and helped develop fiber optics for the internet. So I hope that doesn't happen all night. If it does, that's going to be really annoying. Okay, yes, so I'm from uh, right down the road from Corning. There's a tiny little town called Big Flats, New York. Yes, that's how rural, yeah. Okay, uh, I live in Denver, Colorado. You know that. I like to ski. Uh, that's me and my wife skiing at Breckenridge. Uh, so let's talk about progressive web applications. I'm often going to refer to progressive web applications as just PWAs. So if I say PWA, that's what I'm talking about. So here's a definition from Mozilla Developer Network. Basically, progressive web applications use modern web APIs along with traditional enhancement to create cross-platform web applications. So let's take a look at an example. I've given this presentation a bunch of times, and oftentimes I don't do the example to the end. And one of the feedbacks I got was, hey, we'd love to see a really concrete example to start with. So if you've got uh, your browser, if you've got Chrome uh, on, installed on Mac, uh, or Windows, I believe, um, you should be able to go to app.starbucks.com. And now, does anybody in here use the Starbucks app on their phone? We got a couple of Starbucks drinkers? Okay. So you're going to pop this up, and you're going to be like, holy cow, that looks like insanely like the app that's on my phone. Um, and it's very, very similar, and they did a really good job with this. And so this is a progressive web application. When you go to this application, this doesn't look any different than any other website or web application, right? I mean. I can sign in, I can start an order, I can, I can place the order. You can literally use this in your browser and, and go down the street and pick up your coffee or your latte, right? But what's cool is um, if you look here that 
now, I think this came out in Chrome 72, which is about eight months ago in Mac. Um, there's now this ability to install Starbucks. So this is pretty cool, right? So I'm a Starbucks user, I use it a lot. Um, and I'm like, hey, I want a better experience, right? I want a progressively better experience. So what if I go ahead and just install Starbucks? So the first thing I'm gonna get prompted is, I'm gonna get like a browser prompt, you know, really, you know, is this, are you sure this is what you wanna do? Do you wanna install this app? I'm gonna go ahead and click it. Picking up where we left off, uh, it's interesting, oh, whatever. It shows that it's actually installed at this location under applications Chrome apps. Uh, you can see here. But right here is the app. Let me kind of move it down there so you can see it, right? And so this app looks and feels just like the website, but it's better, right? Because it, it has ability to do things that not just a website can. Um, things like background synchronization of data uh, and some of the things that we're gonna be talking about. So that's an example of a progressive web application where, as you notice, progressively, I'm able to get a better experience by installing this app. And this app is also runnable, so if I go ahead and just close this out, if I use like my spotlight search and say I want to open up Starbucks, there it is, right? So it's an app that the operating system knows about, right? And so I can quit it, I can put it in background, I can minimize it, all these kinds of things. I have a question. So does the app actually have to have Chrome installed to run? Yeah, so it's a little bit by it's a little bit different, and I can I think I have a slide on that that I'll kind of speak to that. Uh, but in this particular instance, I'm running it on my Mac, so that's actually a Chrome shell. It's actually just like a Chromeless Chrome, right? So there's no Chrome around it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you can you install um, the app? Would you be able to install the present web app in a software as a service too, where you have a portal? Or not. I would think so. Yeah, I think so. Maybe I'd have to see a little bit more about what you're trying to do. But uh, we'll then talk about this a little bit more. But progressive web apps are installable on mobile, on desktop, right? And so it's, uh, I would suspect that in your case, you'd be able to leverage progressive web apps. So um, I guess we're going to bail on this. I guess we're going to go to the, the HDMI. Sorry. What are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so PWAs. Uh, so Google basically, if you go on their website and you do a Google search for progressive web apps and you go on uh, Google's like web.dev, I think is what it's called, uh, they'll talk about PWAs around three different criterias. So the first one is reliable, and we want <clears throat> fast and engaging. So let's break that down. So what do we mean by reliable? Reliable means that whether I'm on a slow connection or on no connection at all, I still have an application that feels like it's an application, right? So if I download an app on the App Store and I go offline, then unless it's like an email application, but even then it's probably got all the email cached, right? So if I have Gmail on my phone and I'm on a plane and I don't have Wi-Fi, and I load up Gmail, I can still see my email, right? It's not like the app is like, whoops, sorry, no connection, can't do this, right? You still have this capability to actually use the application. Um, now, of course, I can't get new emails until I connect again, but I can probably have some sort of cache of the emails that I've already downloaded. Uh, the other thing we want is fast. So we talk a lot about this in, in the language of the web, and if you're familiar with this uh, term, it's called time to interactivity, or TTI, right? And so we want to minimize that. And what that means is we want our applications to be interactive as soon as possible. Ideally, your application should have a TTI of less than three seconds. So they've done a lot of studies, and that's kind of what Google is pushing us towards, is within three seconds, when a user either launches into your application or types in app.starbucks.com, they should be able to inter start interacting with the application within three seconds. So that means you've got to have everything down, loaded, ready to go within those three seconds. We also want our progressive web applications to be engaging, right? So think about native applications have this certain level of engagement, whether that's push notifications or whatever it is, it's like you're, you're familiar with it, it feels like an app, right? And so progressive web applications should feel like an app as well. The other thing that's important to know about progressive web applications is 
we're not talking about making hybrid applications. And let me define that for a second real quick. Um, if you're a web developer and you want to create a native application or a hybrid native application, you can use frameworks like Ionic or NativeScript to use web technologies to build applications that are going to be deployed to the App Store or to Google Play. Right? And we call those hybrid applications because you can deploy them to either, usually from a similar or same code base, and you're using web applications. You could call native applications, and this line is getting more and more blurred in my opinion today, native applications would be Kotlin or Java on Android, or uh, Objective-C and Swift, right, on iOS. So progressive applications are just escaping the tab. Basically, we're ripping them out of Chrome, out of the tab, and we're making them progressively better, right? Uh, real quick. And the last thing I want to mention is these two very intelligent people that worked at Google wrote a paper, paper by this name. And I would encourage you, if you're interested in like, what, where did this all come from? I think it was in 2012, don't quote me on that, that they wrote this paper called Escaping the Tab, Progressive, Not Hybrid. And that's by Alex Russell and Francis Berriman. You got a question? So where would like Electron apps fall into that? Yeah, Electron apps, I mean, they're kind of a hybrid app too, in essence, right? Because it's just, right? I mean, it's still not like, you're not writing it in uh, whatever, you know, on like Windows or Mac, Objective-C on Mac or Windows with like C Sharp or whatever, like a native, you know what I mean? So Electron, I think, would be in that same, in that hybrid space, if you ask me. Now, of course, you might get different opinions from different people and, and kind of where everything is in that, so... So at this point, you might be asking yourself, well, wow, Brian, this sounds like a really big promise. Like, holy cow, uh, I don't know if I believe this. <laughs> uh, and so you might be thinking, well, does this really work across platforms and browsers? And the answer is for the most part, and I say most part, it's like a little asterisk, right? For the most part, yes. So in browsers, we've got support for these modern APIs that PWAs use in Chrome, Firefox, recently dropped in Safari last summer, I believe, and then also Edge as well. We also have support on mobile. Uh, we have support on Android. Google has kind of been the pioneer behind this technology. We've had it in Android for, I don't know, three, four years maybe, something like that. Uh, and then iOS just approved some kind of minimal functionality for progressive web applications. Uh, and that happened last year as well. And I think we're going to continue to actually see more of that. I didn't get a chance to look at it, but I saw somebody tweet about uh, the WWDC that happened yesterday. And they actually showed uh, a PWA, or there was maybe there was a link to a PWA somewhere in the docs. And, and some of my friends that are into PWAs are like, holy cow, is this Apple? Like, really? They've created a PWA? Like, it's a big deal. Um, and there's a lot of opinions around that. Personally, if you ask me, it might have to do with something with the billions of dollars that they make off the App Store, but I don't know. Uh, and then lastly, we have desktop. So on Windows, uh, you can install PWA with Chrome. You can also use PWAs in the Windows Store. Uh, that actually runs, remember you had a question about what it runs inside of. If you're using Windows and you install it through the store, it actually runs inside of Edge, and it's much more performant uh, because it'll actually just use a single uh, edge like instance on Windows, whereas if you have a PWA on Windows and Chrome, it's actually going to have multiple instances of Chrome all running at the same time. Uh, so it's a little more performant if you're targeting Windows to actually go through the store. And you have to create, can't think of the technology, what do they call it? Uh, if you do a Google search, you can find it. There's a specific kind of wrapper that you got to put around your PWA in order to submit it to the Windows store and that kind of stuff. And then obviously, as you saw on desktop with Chrome, I can install PWAs as well. So how do we accomplish this? There's basically four main things that we need to know about to create a PWA. We're going to be using what's called an app shell. And that's going to allow us to have the shell of our application come in first and allow that to minimize that TTI. We're going to use what's called service workers. That's a modern web API. And then we're going to be using a manifest file. So kind of like you might use a manifest file in like in your head of your HTML document to inform the browser that you are a progressive web application. Uh, and then we're also going to be using some progressive technologies. So real quickly, let's talk about what is an app shell. So basically, an app shell is before we load our entire application, 
we're going to use this strategy of an app shell. Where we're actually just going to load in the shell of our application first, and then lazily we're going to load in the rest of the content behind the scenes. So you can see here in this, uh, while this is loading up, <clears throat> that around point, uh, five seconds in, I've already got my app shell, and then it takes another point, you know, 400 milliseconds for like, and it's a very basic app, obviously, uh, but for the rest of the app to kind of come in. And we want to do that so that way the user gets that initial experience really, really quickly. The next thing we're going to uh, leverage is what's called service workers. So service workers enable us to do things like offline, uh, allow us to do versioning, so installing and updating new versions of our application. It allows us to do things like notifications, uh, you know, notifications that you might see either on a mobile device or on a desktop device. Uh, and then we can also do background sync, where when the application is not in front of the user, we can actually be syncing data in the background uh, and fetching data as we need to do so. Uh, I've got a quick note in there. Uh, this is still in draft as of today, so kind of use at your own risk. Uh, but you can go out to Mozilla Developer Network, and you can read about the APIs that are in draft format, and you can start to leverage those today. Yeah, sure. What do you got? So, <clears throat> when you have an application loaded on Android, right, you ask for permission to use your devices and stuff like that. With this uh, progressive web app, does it still ask you? Because, I mean, I saw the background thing, right? So, you got a malicious thing going, and then it's doing all kinds of fun background. So, I think I know to a certain extent what you're talking about. Like, when you create an Android app, you have like a, in the manifest, where you have, you have all the stuff that you're going to like basically allow. do and allow. Uh, so you don't have to do anything like that with a progressive web app. Obviously, you have to ask the user to install it, so they have to approve it. And then when, for notifications, I know they have to approve notifications as well, but I'm not sure about the background sync, if they have to approve that or not. So I just, I haven't played that much with it, so you'll have to see how, how that works. I can't confirm. You can't deny the permissions. You can go in and actually turn it off and yeah. say, don't allow it to run background data. Yeah. There you go. Cool. But it acts like an app when installed. It so it feels like an app, yeah. and actually, you can. There's a Starbucks app as well, and if you like uninstall the PWA and then install the Starbucks app, it's going to feel the exact same. Like they're very, very similar, um, as far as what I've seen. Okay, so quickly, let's talk about the life cycle of a progressive web application, uh, or excuse me, of a service worker. So when the user comes to your website and they say, "Yes, I want to install your PWA," uh, it uses this service worker API. And so this service worker API has a very simple life cycle. So first the user says, yes, go ahead and install this. And so we'll begin installing the service worker. During that time, the application cannot be force quit, right? Because it's in this install kind of state. Once it gets there, it can either error out, if there's an error during the installation, or it becomes activated. And then once it's activated, basically it's ready to go. It's installed, if you will. And then after that, we go into the idle mode. And then during idle mode, you can all, the user can terminate it at any time, you know, quit out of the application, or the operating system can do that. So um, iOS, for example, if you have low memory available, it'll actually just start closing out some of your apps that maybe haven't been used in a long time, because it basically controls that. I don't know if Android does the same thing, um, but the operating system is allowed to terminate the application at that time. Also, when we're in idle, is when we're going to be able to deal with what's called fetch and messaging. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. So there's a couple things to note, especially for you that are starting to think, okay, well, how do I wrap my head around the code? And we're going to definitely get into some code here in a second. Um, but a service worker executes in this, or a, yeah, service worker executes in what's called uh, the service worker global scope. So it's kind of like another scope, right? So it's not executing in the acts in the in the DOM, right? So you don't have like window dot, right? Or document dot body, right? So it kind of executes, and this is, bef you do have access to that once you actually get into your progressive web application, uh, but during this like setup phase, and you're gonna see this code in a second. So we don't have access to the DOM, it executes in this special scope where we can register things. Uh, it also requires HTTPS, so you have to have a certificate and TLS, and you can't do any synchronous fetching, you can only do asynchronous fetching. The other thing that we need to understand is this idea of a cache storage. Um, so remember that example I was talking about with Gmail, 
where I load up my app and maybe if I'm offline, I can still access all of my emails, right? And so we're going to do that using this cache storage with our progressive web application uh, inside our service worker. And cache storage, this is not the caching of like the last decade or whatever, if you will, of browsers. So if I go to google.com, my browser is going to cache things, right? And then that cache can, it can be fully primed. It can, the browser can flush that cache at any time. The user can empty the cache of the browser, right? And so that's kind of a cache that's not reliable, right? And that's fine. And that's a good thing that we have that in browsers. But with service workers, we also have this new cache and this new cache service called cache storage. And you as the developer have complete control over it. So you get to put things in the cache, you get to expunge things out of the cache. And if the user goes to like, you know, clear my cache, it's not going to clear the cache, right? So this is actually stored on the device, on the disk or memory or whatever it is. And it's persisted. Um, and so it's available to the service worker via this property inside this special scope that we just talked about. Uh, called the caches property. So we're going to use the open method to open the cache and we'll use match to see if anything's in the cache. And we're going to mainly be caching. We can cache lots of things, but one of the things we're going to be caching frequently are requests, right? So if I make a request out to Gmail to get all your email and it responds, I want to kind of cache that entire response. So that way I have that available. So that way if the user goes offline and tries to make that same request, I can almost be like a man in the middle and be like, oh, I don't have an offline. Oh, here's the request. And it just comes back to the web application as if they were online. It just gets served out of the cache. Uh, here's a couple, just kind of a breakdown here. Uh, so match returns a promise. It resolves that the request exists. Uh, we can see that put puts a request and response into the cache. So it's basically uh, a map. And then we can also delete requests out of the cache. OK, so let's look at some code. So how do we actually start registering our service worker, which kind of is part of the a bulk of our progressive web application? The first thing we want to do, obviously, is make sure that the browser supports service workers. So we're going to see if serv service worker exists uh, in the navigator. And if it does, we're going to go ahead and register the service worker. And we're going to point it to a file. And in this instance, I just called it sw.js. The browser is going to fetch that file, and it's going to execute the JavaScript in that sw.js in that special scope, in that special context that we've been talking about. And this is what that file might look like. Let's say we have a name of our application. I got a bunch of content that I want to cache initially. And then inside, again, this is inside that special scope. I can say, go ahead and add an event listener when the user installs this application to do whatever, right? And in this instance, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the cache, and I'm going to go ahead and fetch a whole bunch of stuff and add all this content into my cache. So that way, I've got it ready to go when the user clicks on the Starbucks, double clicks to open it. It's got all this, all these files kind of on the, uh, on the disk and ready to be launched. Uh, and we're going to use uh, that event.wait until just to kind of, that's that like blocking, like, uh, don't let the user uh, quit this app until I get everything installed. Because otherwise, if you get like two of these files and not the rest, the app's just going to be in this broken state. So the next thing we need to understand is this idea of like fetching and caching all these fetches. And the big, the easiest way to understand this is actually think of like a man in the middle attack, which I know is a really bad thing, right? Like you don't want that to happen normally. Um, but in a service worker context, this is really good because we control it and we're the man in the middle. And so every time a fetch occurs, I can cache it or I can say I'm just going to return something straight out of the cache or I can actually go and do the fetch and then cache it when it comes back. Uh, and so let's take a look at uh, an example of that. So here I'm going to say go ahead and add an event listener to fetch. All right, so we're going to be using the new fetch API. Uh, you might as well because you're already using modern APIs as is, so you don't need to use XHR. Uh, so we're going to check if a resource exists in the cache. And if not, we're going to go ahead and actually perform the fetch and go out on the network and grab it. And then we're going to cache the resource. And then we're going to return that cached resource, that response, right? And now that we've got that fetched, or, or excuse me, now that we've got that cached, the next time the user makes a request, I've got it in the cache. And if I want to, I could immediately give it back to them, like instantaneously. Or I could say, oh, you know, I appears I'm online. Let's go ahead and get the new version of that, cache that, and give it to them. Right? So you're literally a man in the middle between the, the application and the network. So let's take a look at what that code might look like. <clears throat> so here in this instance, let me kind of back up over here. 
Uh, we're going to basically use this caches. <coughs> That's that uh, <coughs> property in our context. And we're going to say, hey, if I've got this request, and then here's my, uh, it's promisey, right? So here's my callback function. I'm going to say, if I've got a, a response, so that's the R, go ahead and return that spon uh, response if that's truthy. If it's falsy value or undefined or null, then let's go ahead and actually do the fetch of the request. And then when that response comes back, let's go ahead and open the cache with the name that was requested. And then we're going to get the cache, or this is the name of the cache, excuse me. And then we're going to take that, uh, actual cache instance, and we're going to put the request and the clone of the response into our cache, and then just return out the response that we were given. So this is that instance where we're kind of serving as a man in the middle, and we're caching all of the responses that come through. Uh, is, why do you use clone there? Uh, you clone the response. Uh, I'd have to double check. It's like you don't actually store the, the actual response because you're returning that back out. And it could be mutated later, I think, is basically the idea. So I want to clone it right now how it is, right? Because if, if it's not immutable and we do, the developer does something with a response, I don't want that affecting my cache. I believe that's the reason why you, you pretty much always, I know this is what somebody tells you, right? This is just the way you do it, Eric, okay? You, you clone it. <laughs> yeah. Is there a way to essentially ask the device or the OS or whatever, do I have network? In other words, does it make sense to try to do the fetch, or will that just air around it as well? Yeah, um, I'm trying to think. I believe you do, uh, but that's such a fuzzy gray area, honestly. Because sometimes, like, you really don't have network. Like, if I don't have a Wi-Fi connection, like, I don't have network. Or my cell, like, if I'm on airplane mode, it'll say, yeah, you don't have network. But if I have one bar and a very spotty 3G service, technically I have network. So then what we want to do is we want to have some sort of timeout. And we're going to get the, into that in a second. And I can say after three seconds, let's just assume that it's not going to respond and just give it the stuff out of the cache. So if I load up Gmail, and like in this instance we keep kind of talking about, uh, and I clearly don't have a network request, I'll know about that. But if I have a very slight network request or something that never responds, that's, I mean, we can never really trust the network, right? Um, then I'm going to put a timeout on that and say, and you know, business decides or you as a developer decides, you know, after three seconds, we're just going to fail over to the cache and just give them what they have. And maybe we say, it appears you're not online or poor network connection. Okay, so the other thing that we can do with the Service Worker API is notifications. Um, and so native applications have this kind of ability to do notifications, whether you like it or not. Uh, and you can disable them, right? Uh, just like in your app, you could turn off the notifications, right? Just like a native app, right? Uh, and so here, in this instance, this is an example of what it might look like if we want to use the notification API. Um, so in this instance, I've got a button. It's got an ID of subscribe. I'm going to go ahead and get access to that just using document.getElementById. I'm going to add an event listener on the click event. I'm going to go ahead and use the notification API. I'm going to request permission. How many of you have gone to a website and it's like, whatever, you know, Furry Turtles wants to send you notifications or whatever the website is that you're at or Chewy.com. I don't know why it's like Furry Turtles. <laughs> I've never gone to FurryTurtles.com, I swear. Uh, do Chewy.com or whatever it is. I don't even look, Google it. I don't even know what it is. Uh, and you've seen that like drop down on you. Have you guys experienced that before? Who likes that? Anybody raise their hand. Okay, good. I hate it. Like, I kind of feel like we're friends, but we're not that close. And now you want to like <laughs> start like sending me notifications? Like, hold on. Like, like we haven't even like dated yet, you know? Uh, so, so in this example, that's why I did this on purpose. So the user actually has to click the button before we can do the request permission. So this is a promise, the API. Uh, it's going to return a promise when it resolves. Uh, we get the result back. It's either granted or I think failed or an empty string. And if the user granted for whatever reason, they really want to get notifications, uh, then now we can start to show notifications to the user, right? Uh, so the notification API is, as far as I know, very stable and available out there. Um, you can use it today in your applications, whether they're progressive uh, web apps or not. Um, I would encourage you to really make sure that like the user wants the notifications rather than just like waiting three seconds after the page loads to prompt them, but anyways. 
Uh, any questions before we kind of keep moving on? That was a lot on service workers and the modern APIs and service workers. Okay, we've got a bunch more content to get through. So uh, real quickly, this is the manifest file. I'm not going to go through the details here. You're basically going to drop in a, a link tag in your head. It says, hey, here's a manifest file. Go, go out on uh, MDN or your favorite website and, and figure out. They'll tell you what you put in all of this. You have all the icons all the different sizes of the icons. If you've ever done native application development, you have to have like 20 different sizes for retina and non-retina and high density and iPad and all these things. And so you'll do that kind of similarly. Um, you'll give it your entry, your start URL. That's basically your entry point to your application. Um, and you can theme, theme the actual Chrome. Remember when I had Starbucks open, how I had that nice, beautiful Starbucks green around it? Uh, that's because they use the theme color of whatever the Starbucks color is. Uh, here it is in the, the link tag. So instead of rel style sheet, you do rel manifest and then give it the uh, href to your JSON file. Okay, so that's progressive web applications like non-Angular, right? So in general, you don't need to use Angular to do progressive web applications. If you're not using Angular, that's fine. You can do it in React. You can do it in all kinds of things. You can build great applications without Angular that are per, uh, PWAs. Uh, but if you are using Angular, uh, then service workers actually fit, uh, or PWAs fit really, really, really well with Angular and how Angular works. Uh, Angular has its own service worker module that's gonna uh, make it really easy to get up and running uh, with a service worker. You'll literally be able to use the Angular CLI. Uh, you type ng add, and then at Angular forward slash PWA, and then it'll just throw everything in your uh, application for you and get you started with service workers and uh, PWAs. Uh, the other thing that Angular is, is if you know this, Angular is a, a single page application framework. And so it works really well. If you think about an, uh, you know, an app like that Starbucks app, it's the whole Chrome. Uh, so it works really well. Uh, Angular has things like code splitting, lazy loading, and prefetching that works really well with PWAs as well. So like I just mentioned, we can simply use the Angular CLI to ng-add a progressive web application to our existing Angular application. And then I can just build it out. We're going to use a prod build, uh, which we should be doing before we go to production, so we have ahead of time compilation. And then one of the things you need to know, and you can, you can get more info on the docs on angular.io, uh, you actually, instead of using the, uh, uh, the built-in development server, that uses Webpack under the hood in the Angular CLI, the ng-serve command, if you're familiar with that. Uh, you can't do that with a progressive web application, so you actually need to use some sort of other HTTP server. So you can just npm or npx uh, HTTP server is an easy one to use, and we're going to start it up on 8080, and we're going to point it to our disk directory where we just built our Angular app and whatever the project name was. Uh, so just keep in mind, if you try to ng-serve, and you can't really test your PWA in that environment. Uh, I think I have a small video here. Uh, you can see right now I'm online uh, and I, I'm loading the service worker file and then I just refreshed and now you can see that this actually came from the service worker. I know it's a little blurry on this monitor. Uh, and now I reload it again after I went offline. This is checked offline. And now you can see that the app is still loading. Um, and we'll let it, in case you didn't see all of that, run through again. And now underneath Applications tab in Chrome DevTools, you can actually see your service worker installed. And you can uh, muck with it that way as a developer. You can remove it and see the versions and all that kind of stuff. Um, so again, here I'm going offline. I'm reloading. My app still works. It's loading all these files. Remember that fetch, that man in the middle? It's saying, oh, I'm offline. Oh, I've got these files in cache. Here you go. Right? It doesn't matter that I'm not connected to the internet. Uh, and then you can see the uh, kind of service worker debug information down there. So out of the box, when you add PWAs to your Angular applications, we're going to cache a bunch of files by default. You have full control over these um, in this new file that's going to get dropped into your source directory called ngswconfig.json. Uh, but by default, we're going to cache that index.html, which is kind of your app shell. We're going to cache the icon. We're going to cache every, all the JS files that you created when you did ng build in your disk directory, and then all the CSS files, and then any other assets that you have with your application that you're shipping with the application. Uh, so that's what's going to be automatically cached by default uh, when the user installs your application. So there's a couple things to note about the installation modes in Angular. 
So Angular has two installation modes when you actually install an application. So the first one here is called prefetch. Again, this is all configurable in that ngswconfig.json. So by default, uh, uh, I think it's prefetch. I'm fairly certain it's prefetch by default. So when the user installs your progressive web application, we're actually going to go out, everything I just mentioned, it's going to fetch all those resources and put them in the cache. So that way when the user comes back, they're all right there and ready to go. If you don't want to do that, that seems a little heavy to you as far as a strategy, you can do what's called lazy loading, right? Where it, only until it's fetched do we then cache it. So if you've got a large application and you're doing a lot of code splitting, and I've seen some really big Angular applications that are literally have like 80 JS files because they're doing all these lazy loaded routes and code splitting, right? If you don't want to fetch all 80 of those files and cache them in the beginning, that seems like a lot to you. You can do lazy, and it's not till the user actually browses and makes that JS fetch for that, whether it's a lazy loaded route or whatever you're doing for code splitting. And then once that fetch comes in, then it gets cached, and now it's ready for the next time. You can also do versioning with Angular PWAs. So you can serve an app from the cache. You can check for new versions. We can fetch new versions in the background. And then the, by default, what will happen is, is uh, so the user installs your PWA, uh, they've got it up and running. In the background, we're going to check for a new version, and Angular does this for you. If there is a new version of your application, it'll download it and fetch it all for you. And then once the user reloads your application and comes back again, then it'll install the new version and use that. You can also manually, there's a service that you can inject. Uh, we'll get into it in a second. I don't remember the exact name of it. Uh, but there's a service that you can inject uh, via dependency injection. And then you have, you can say, no, I have a new version. I want to restart it right now. Or maybe you tell the, the user, do you want to, you know, relaunch or something? And then it'll reload the next version of your application. So there's a couple strategies around those updates. Again, there's that prefetch and then also that lazy strategy, right? And so we can download and cache those, that request immediately. Uh, or we can wait until, and then we can cache it, like I mentioned before. So here's that SW update service. Uh, this is injectable, and I can see there's an, uh, an observable called available, and that's going to be an observable that emits a notification value that's of type update available event. And I can see if there's a new update available. I can see if that update has been activated. Uh, I can see if I'm enabled, if I'm within a progressive web app context. And then I can also manually check for updates if I want, and I can also manually activate an update as well. So again, you have control over it as a developer if you want to, but out of the box, you kind of get some of these things already like uh, pre-wired up for you uh, by Angular. So here's one of the things that you were asking about earlier in terms of the network connectivity and the timeout. So when we make these requests in Angular uh, or using the Angular service worker uh, implementation, we can configure some settings and we can configure max size, max age, timeout, and strategy. So anytime we make that fetch, that man in the middle, if you will, right, we can say, I only want to cache 100 files or 1,000 files or whatever it is. I can set some sort of max size. I can also set a max age. So if I'm a news application or something, I can say I only want to cache things, you know, that are a week, within a week, or however many uh, uh, hours or something like that. I can also set that timeout. And here's where that maximum time to wait for requests is. So if I want to only wait, you know, 3,000 milliseconds and then just fail over to the cache, I can do that. And then I can have a, a strategy around uh, those fetching. So performance is the default, I believe. No, I think freshness is the default. I'd have to double check. Uh, but basically, this is also configurable in ngsw-config.json. Uh, and so performance is basically if a user needs a particular JS file or CSS or whatever it is, image or whatever I've got cached, by, uh, the performance says it'll just use the cached version first and it'll just send it right back to the user. As long as it meets these other requirements like max age, right? But if I've exceeded the max age of that file, then obviously it's going to go out and try to make that request. Uh, in terms of the other strategy is freshness. So this is actually going to try that fetch first. As long as it doesn't time out, uh, I'm going to give them that response. If it does time out, then I'm going to fail over to whatever I have in the cache. Uh, so those are some configuration options for you as well uh, inside that ngsw.json. Uh, so the last thing, we're coming down to the very end here, that I want to give you some tips 
uh, <laughs> some things that I've learned doing progressive web apps over the last about two years. Uh, the first thing is do not cache your service worker, like ever, 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 right? Because if you cache that, remember that very beginning, that sw.js file? If you cache that and you're, let's say, you know, your, uh, your ops team sets that by default on all static files that they're cached for like, I don't know, six months. If you do that, your, up, your user will never get an update of their application for six months and you are locked out. And there's ways to bust it, but it's a real pain in the rear, okay? So whatever you do, don't allow any sort of browser caching. This is that like traditional caching, right? Not the cache control that we've been talking about mostly. That traditional caching, do not allow the browser to cache the service worker file. Avoid that at all costs. So we're gonna do that by setting a cache control header on the response, and we're gonna set the max age to zero, and that'll basically tell the browser, don't ever keep this in cache. The other thing that you might be thinking is like, well, first of all, maybe you're not an Angular developer because I know we've got maybe some people that aren't here, uh, or maybe at work you're doing React and you're just interested in Angular, um, and that's cool. Uh, if you're not using Angular and you don't have this kind of baked in support that Angular comes with for progressive web applications, I would recommend uh, an open source project by Google called Workbox. Uh, Workbox is a very extensible, very robust implementation for progressive web applications that you can use. Uh, with the Angular implementation, it's going to get you out of the box. It's going to get you going up and running fast and easy. But there might be some like th things where you're like running into walls or this is a really like a hurdle or whatever it is. Uh, when that happens, you might need to not use Angular's PWA module and consider a mo more robust solution. And that workbox would be the answer to that. Um, they've got a ton and ton of stuff built into it. Uh, you get a whole talk, honestly, on Workbox. Uh, you check it out online if you want. Um, one of the things I actually like about Workbox, and you can use both for what it's worth. You could bring in Workbox and still use the Angular PWA and Service Worker module. Um, but one of the things that's nice about Workbox is it's got like baked in support for Google Analytics. So if you want to track analytics, even in like an offline mode when the user is using your application and then send that off to uh, Google Analytics once they get it online, it just does that for you. I mean, it's Google, right? They want you to use their, their products. So, um, so Google Analytics is like baked right in. It makes it super simple and easy to use. Uh, so check that out. Uh, the other tool that I have for you, the other kind of pro tip is Lighthouse. If you're not familiar with this, this is built into Chrome. Um, this is in the dev tools. There's also an extension and there's also a node CLI. So if you want to use Lighthouse, to enforce things on, um, you know, PRs and merges and uh, your CI CD pipeline, you can do that as well. And Lighthouse allows us to do web app performance and also has a service worker checklist. And you can make sure that your app is meeting the criteria of a service worker um, and also all the performance stuff that comes with Lightbox as well in terms of uh, high performance web apps. Do you have, what do you think is a, is good performance for an Angular application? That is a really vague question. <laughs> well, because I mean, they have the colors, right? In 70 is a yellow, and I think 50 is a red, and 90 is a green. Is that? I'm not sure, about. I've never heard of that. Oh, yeah, Lighthouse does the, the little circles. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yes. Sorry, yeah, now I'm following you. Yeah, so is that, do you, has that been your experience? That 90 is fast and yellow, 70s, 80s are kind of? Yeah, generally. Uh, it can take a lot of work. Uh, I've worked with a client that wanted to get like all hundreds and it could take a lot of work to get that the, that final like 10% can be really difficult sometimes. Um, especially when you start thinking about like critical path CSS and all the things that they want you to do. It can be a little challenging. But if you do it all, I mean you get a lot of performance benefits and then the other side of that is also like the SEO benefit, right? Um, so having your app respond really quickly is a good thing in general for SEO, for your users, for your customers, all of that. So, um, yeah, I mean, the better you can do on these scores. I mean, if you're like an, enter I've worked, you know, done a lot of enterprise development. I mean, this isn't on the radar, right? I mean, it's, it, the, you know, the app sits on a box behind a firewall on-prem. Everybody's just loading it up over a network, over a Cat6 or Fiber or whatever. They don't care, you know. Um, but this is certainly something that you can start to integrate into. You know, if you've got apps where that matters, yeah.
Yeah. And then you should also look at Angular Universal and do server-side rendering. I mean, if you're already focused on web performance, you should be doing server-side rendering of your application. So that way, the user gets that initial render super, super fast. And that also will help with SEO. So, yeah. All right, cool. Uh, so the, the last thing, I put this slide in because I've done this talk. I've actually done this talk about eight times, and I did it in Zurich like uh, six months ago. And people come up to me afterwards and they're like, well, should I do this like today? Like, I mean, you talked a lot about browser support and all this stuff, but do I, do I really need to do this today? And does it make sense to do it? Yeah, it does. Uh, <laughs> start doing it like today. Uh, even if you're not building, let me just say this real quick. Even if you're not building like an installable progressive web application, if you've got an app that users are using every day and you're shipping the same JS files to them, like every time they load it, that's insane. Use the service worker, cache those files. You can ng add the PWA thing. It's so fast and easy to get up and running with it. And your users are going to thank you because they're going to launch your app and they're going to be like, holy cow, your app loaded super fast. And you're going to be like, yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Right? So seriously consider doing it. I know that there might not be a lot of value for, for enterprises and businesses, but I would argue that there is. Um, and so I would look at doing it even in large enterprise apps or even your apps that are, that you're building today that may not be installable PWAs. You can leverage a lot of this technology. It's in the browsers today. So start leveraging and do it. Uh, with that, uh, oh, you know, this slide actually, I should have updated this. I got a couple of things. So we already talked about this. Chrome 73, you saw me in, uh, use it. I think, what is Chrome up to now? Is it 76? Yeah. Yeah. So Chrome 73 launched Mac OS support. That was a big deal. Safari has an iOS has support now. That was last year. That's a big deal. Edge and Windows 10 announced support in the last six months as well. So the ball is rolling and it's getting bigger. <clears throat> the other thing to be on the lookout for that I haven't talked about is streams. You're going to be able to uh, have stream. There's a whole new API coming out uh, for the web on streaming and data. And we're going to be talking a little bit about observables and streams here in the next talk, uh, but this is something different. And then we also, uh, I mentioned that background sync API that's still in draft. Uh, start to look to see that formalized and see that coming out as well. Um, I don't know how fast that's all going to happen, but uh, there's a lot of work being done on this, and I think we'll continue to see improvements in the space. Uh, so uh, how do you get started? i got a couple of links here for you, just in general on PWAs. Um, obviously, MDN, the web docs is a great place to go. Uh, Google developers, that's that three criteria that I talked about in, early on. Uh, here's the Angular docs. You can just go to angular.io if you want and then just search for PWA and that'll get you into this guide. And then I really like this last website. I'm not sure who did it, uh, but pwa.rocks has a lot of good information out there. It's not specific to Angular. It's like vanilla JS or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and check out that website as well, uh, pwa.rocks. Uh, PWA <coughs> and with that, thank you very much. Uh, let's take a break. Is anybody, who's sticking around for the next talk? All right. All right, well, let's take a break and then we'll do observables. Show of hands, who's using RxJS today? Yeah, absolutely. NGRX uses RxJS. So what, about half of us? Okay. How many people have never heard of RxJS at all until we like saw it on the meetup page? Okay. How many people are interested in using it, know about it, but are interested in using it? Some of you? Okay. All right, good. Um, so let's, this is going to be a pretty, this is like an intro to RxJS. Uh, I am not going to be covering, for those of you that maybe are already using RxJS, I'm not going to be covering any of the 100 plus operators that are available to you. Um, so if that is the talk, talk that you're looking for, if you want to leave, I'm not going to be offended. Um, I gave that talk. I thought I did okay. I wouldn't say it was the greatest talk I've ever given, uh, but that talk is available on the Angular, or the Rocky, on the Brebug YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube, search for Brebug, you'll see I did a whole slew of videos. I actually did a talk that was supposed to be 45 minutes and I went an hour and 25 minutes. So, uh, and they sliced it all up into little videos on all the, the, I think I covered about 15 or 20 operators. So I'm not going to be doing an operator talk. There was also a great talk at ng-conf uh, for those of you that are kind of interested in learning about those operators um, that Mike Brocky and 
I can't think of the other guy's name. Um, but they did 20 operators in 20 minutes. And it's a fun talk. They had a lot of good dad jokes in there. Um, I'd encourage you to check that out as well. Uh, and they'll talk about some operators that maybe you haven't heard of, like start with or ends with or um, race or uh, all the different operators that are available. Oof. I don't know. You're stuck on a dessert diet. <laughs> <laughs> stuck on a dessert and I have to pick an RxJS operator? I, I can't do that. That's like trying, that's like asking a parent to choose your favorite child. Like, I can't do that. I mean, secretly, maybe I have a favorite, but you can never say who your favorite is. I, it's just, <laughs> it's a good question. Okay, so what's RxJS? Uh, RxJS is Reactive Extensions for JavaScript. That's what it kind of stands for. Uh, RxJS is one of many implementations of ReactiveX, right? So if you go to reactivex.io, you're going to find implementations for Scala, PHP, C++, Java. Uh, I don't know. Somebody threw out another language. JavaScript, obviously. Um, lots of languages have implemented. There's Rx Swift, absolutely. Um, so a lot of languages ha are adopting uh, this style of programming called reactive programming, and it's primarily kind of the open source movement is around this reactive X um, implementation. So uh, reactive or RxJS allows us to do streams of data. Uh, so when I talk about streams of data, uh, and we're going to get into this in a second, but a good way to think about that is um, think about promises, right? Is, is there anybody that doesn't know what a promise is? And it's okay, you can raise your hand. Everybody knows what a promise is? Okay, good. So a promise is asynchronous, right? After whatever, some time passes. So I start the promise, if you will. After some time, it either resolves or rejects, right? And I get that data back, that, that value, right? Observables, or RxJS, are also asynchronous in the same way that promises are, but they're streams of data. So instead of just getting a single value back after some time passes, I can continue to get values down the stream, right? Another way of thinking about this is like an array, but an array is obviously synchronous, but think about like an array where an array has multiple values, right? So it's like a collection or a stream. Uh, like I mentioned, it's cross-platform, uh, so you can use it in Swift, you can use it in Java or Scala or whatever it is. Um, and the way to think about it is everything is a stream. Uh, and if you really get into that mindset, like a certain Zen will fall over you. Um, and so the base class that we're going to be talking about in this idea is what's called an observable, right? So when I say observable, you can almost kind of, if you're just new to this idea, think promise, but lots of resolves, right? So it's kind of like a promise, but lots of resolves or lots of, or actually just one single reject. Um, because once an observable errors out, the observable stream is complete. Uh, it implements this thing called an observer design pattern in a kind of way. Um, so if you did computer science school, which probably not many of us did, uh, but if you did, uh, you might have learned about this thing called an observer design pattern, which is part of the Gang of Four book. And again, if you went to computer science school, they probably shoved that down your throat. Uh, and you had to learn about all these design patterns like they came out with. I think the book was written in, was it the 80s? Maybe 92, 94? Yeah, yeah, was it in the 80s? It was 94 or 5. It was 90s, right? Yeah. I remember reading it in computer science school. At first, I was just like, Doof! I was like, I, I didn't want anything to do with it. But then I actually kind of was like, wow, this stuff is like actually really amazingly practical. Um, so there is this design pattern called the observer design pattern, and that's kind of what RxJS implements. Uh, so we watch a subject for a notification that's emitted, and these notifications are pushed down to what we call observers, right? So an observer is listening for a notification from that observable, right? And so that's kind of the idea of the observer uh, design pattern. If you Google it, you can see they've got like a little, uh, you know, Wikipedia, you can see the little diagram. Um, the other thing about observables is, at least in JavaScript, and we're talking about ArxJS, which is the JavaScript implementation, is it allows for, kind of think about it as like array style operators, right? So we have operators in ArxJS like map, where I can map every notification or every value that's emitted down the stream, I can map it to something else. Just like I can do array.map, or really it's on the prototype, array.prototype.map, 
right? Or I can filter the, the array, or I can reduce the array. Those same kind of concepts exist in observables, and we can uh, invoke those uh, every time a new notification comes down. So the easiest way to get around this is to start looking at uh, some example code. Let me pull this out. And I am going to need to probably bump the font size. I'm actually going to run this in a terminal here. Uh, what is it, RxJS intro? Okay, so uh, here's our uh, directory. Uh, I'm using the Webpack dev server. Uh, and so I'm just going to start that up. And start dev. I'm using Yarn. You can use NPM if you're following along. Uh, you're going to need to NPM install in the repository first uh, to get some of these dependencies. And I'm going to be running this on localhost 8080. Okay, so here this is running. Uh, this is all going to be console-based. I'm not going to be doing anything actually in the browser. And let's go ahead and open up the index file. Okay, and let's uncomment that out. And basically, if you're again, if you're following along in index.ts, I'm just going to be importing the file uh, while we do each of these demos, and you're just going to uncomment and comment, and then we're going to look at that file and kind of show you what it looks like. Right? Can everybody see that? Is that big enough, or do you want one more size up? We're good? Okay, so uh, everybody raised their, I think nobody raised their hand, I should say, for promises, which is good. Uh, we all know about promises. So to create a promise, we call new promise. Uh, I pass it a function, a callback function, if you will. And that function has two arguments, the resolve and the reject. In this instance, I'm using an ES6 arrow function, and I'm only accepting the first argument, resolve. And then I'm going to set a timeout in the browser. And then after 1,000 milliseconds, I'm going to resolve that promise and uh, pass it a value, which is that string hello from promise land. And then when that resolves, I'm going to go ahead and just log out that value. So uh, pretty easy. So if we come over here, just to prove that it works, it's going to wait a second. And there we go. So it's asynchronous. So after a second, uh, we get hello from promise land. So before we talk a, a lot about observables, and we're going to look at a bunch of demos here, let's firstly cover a couple of the classes and kind of the basics of observables in RxJS. So the first class that we have is the notification class. And the notification class is kind of, is that value that I'm getting, right? So it's a container that represents, you could think about it as an event, but it's really a value, right? And that notification is going to be one of three types. We either get a next notification, which is kind of like a resolve, we get a completion notification, which promises have no idea of a, pre of a completion notification, right? Because a promise either resolves or rejects, that's it. But because we're dealing with streams of data that are long lived, when that stream is done or complete, we'll get a completion notification. And then we also get what's called an error notification. So those notifications are push, pushed through observables to all the observers. So when I subscribe, and we're going to talk about this idea of subscribing. So it's kind of like saying, hey, I want to subscribe to your email, your newsletter, right? So once I subscribe, then I'm going to start receiving those notifications. Like I mentioned, it also includes that metadata about the event or value, including the type of message. And those are those three different types of messages, those three different types of notifications that we can receive. The next thing we under need to understand is the idea of the observer. So the observer is the one that's listening, if you will, to the notifications. So it receives the notification from an observable. It's managed by this class that we call a subscription. And we'll going to talk about that here in a second. And the observer basically reacts to these notifications, whether it's a next error or completion notification from the observable. A subscription is what is created when I subscribe. And I'm an observer. And when I subscribe, right, I create what's called a subscription. And a subscription is that link between an observable and an observer. 
Now, keep in mind, we're going to talk about this at the very end. We have to deal with actually unsubscribing this. So remember in uh, JavaScript, if you're writing any vanilla JS, if you will, today, and you do dot add event listener, what do you need to do afterwards? You need to remove the event listener because otherwise you can create what's called a memory leak, right? Where basically if you're not listening anymore, it's still sending you the value, right? So we'll invoke on the subscription class a method called unsubscribe, which will say, hey, I'm done listening. Just like if you get an email and you're tired of getting REI emails and you're like, I'm done, you hit that little tiny gray hidden unsubscribe link that they bury in the text. Uh, you hit unsubscribe and now you're gonna stop listening from those notifications. It's also important to know that you can add child subscriptions. This is some, something that some people may not be aware of, but a subscription class has an add method, and you can add additional subscriptions to a subscription. So once you unsubscribe from a parent, it'll unsubscribe from all the child subscriptions. And we'll talk a little bit about that more here in a second. So now let's go to observable land. So let's take a look at what an observable looks like. This is kind of the longhand form, but this is very similar to the promise code that we saw before. Oftentimes, as an Angular developer especially, you are probably never going to write new observable because you're usually consuming observables that come back from like an HTTP request or a sort of DOM event or whatever it is, right? And you might use like a static method called from, or is it from event? Did they change it? It's from event. It's from event, right? Uh, we can basically say, hey, from this event, give me an observable, and then it just creates one for you, and you don't have to write all this code, right? But just so we have a basic understanding of observables in our chest, let's look at it kind of under the hood. Um, so in this instance, I'm going to create a new observable. Let's start at the top, actually. So I'm going to import from ArcGIS observable, or you could just import from ArcGIS, actually. Uh, I think the editor did that. I'm going to import that class observable. Then I'm going to new it up. So here I'm going to new up an observable and I'm going to pass it a function that receives the observer, right? So just kind of like we saw in the promise. So now that I've had that observer, inside of the observable, this code is going to be executed, not this code, ignore this for right now, but all this code in here is going to be executed every time somebody subscribes. So once I subscribe down here, it's going to pass it the observer, and it's going to run that code, okay? And here in this instance, all I'm going to do is I'm going to set an interval, and every 2,000 milliseconds, I'm going to call the next method on the observer class, right? And that next method is going to emit a next notification. Remember, we talked about there's three different types of notifications. There's error, completion, and next. And so this is saying the next value is this. And again, because it's not a promise, this is a stream of data, I have an interval rather than a timeout. So I can keep nexting values down the pipe and giving it to my observer, right? Finally, we return a function optionally. You don't have to, you can just return void. But on the observable, uh, uh, on that class, when I new it up, I can return a factor, or excuse me, a function, and that function is gonna be invoked as a teardown. And that's basically gonna, that's your opportunity to clean anything up inside the observable that was created as a result of a subscription. In this instance, I created an interval, and so I'm going to want to clean that up, right? I don't want to just leave that interval running after somebody unsubscribes. So I'm going to return a function. I'm going to clear that interval that I had up above, and so that's kind of our opportunity to tear things down. Down here on that observable instance, it's important to note here that I have this code, but unlike promises, uh, nothing is actually happening until I subscribe. If I comment this code out, this is never going to run. Well, it's going to create the observable instance, but it's never going to create the interval, right? Because it doesn't run until you actually subscribe. So then now once I subscribe, here the first argument, subscribe takes three arguments. The first argument, they're all functions. The first argument is a function that's going to get invoked when a next notification is received. The second argument is going to be invoked when a error notification is received, and then the third argument is when we get a completion notification, right? And I can omit those. So in this instance, I'm really only interested in a next notification. So when I get a next notification, here's my arrow function. I'm going to get that value, whatever was nexted into it, if you will, and then I'm just going to simply log out that value. So if we take a look at this, we should see this run. So I'm going to go over to index.ts. I'm going to go down to observable. I'm going to uncomment that and hit save. I'm going to have to exit out every time. And 
you can see, well, it's, it's incrementing the number. I know it's kind of hard to see the gray right there. Um, but we're going to get a new value. Was that every 2,000 milliseconds, I think? Um, we're going to get that next value, right? And so this is a stream of data that we've created that's coming down through the observable. Any questions kind of before we keep going? Good. Awesome. So the next thing you might be asking yourself is, all right, well, this is all pretty cool, but like, is this baked into the browser yet? And we got this thing called RxJS. What's the deal with this? Um, so is this an ECMAScript standard? Unfortunately, no, not quite yet. Um, so right now, RxJS is an open source library. Uh, you can contribute it to your uh, contribute as well. Uh, so it's open source on GitHub, uh, and it basically provides observables in Rx in the browser today. I will say that there is a TC39 proposal. So that's the working group that deals with this kind of stuff inside of the ECMA. ECMA I think is the organization. Um, and so there's a proposal that's currently in stage one. The last I heard, uh, there's like stage zero through stage three. So stage one means like this has some legs, right? But in order to get from stage one to further stages, you have to have what's called a champion. And a champion has to be somebody who's on the TC3 committee that basically works for one of the main, like Google, Microsoft, Maybe Netflix has a chance, has a, a seat on the committee. I don't know. Um, but right now there's not a champion behind it. And so it's just kind of waiting there. Um, hopefully and eventually we're going to get observables natively, like we have promises in the browser. Um, eventually, uh, I think that will happen. Honestly, I think there's a lot of questions around how does this impact the actual underpinnings? of everything else that they're doing that's very promisey APIs, right? And and kind of there's a big like they could just drop this in the browser today, but then it has a lot of far reaching opportunities underneath the hood in the browser. And so just how far would that go is kind of I think the question. Uh oh I already stopped for questions. I think we're good. But I got this cool little gif. Okay, cool. So we've talked about observables, and we saw the observable class. Um, and if you're using Angular today, observables are, I guess I would call them like a first class citizen, basically, to the Angular framework. Um, so if you're not using Angular, let me kind of explain real quickly. Uh, Angular is a very opinionated framework. It's not like React is a fantastic framework that deals with components and deals with like kind of UI and, and that kind of thing. Angular is much more far reaching than that, whether you like that or not. Um, and so Angular includes an HTTP client module or an HTTP implementation. If you're using React, you're probably bringing in something like Axios or another thing that you may flavor uh, for doing your fetches in XHR. Um, but Angular kind of ships with one. And if you're dealing with anything that's asynchronous in Angular, you're dealing with observables, right? Now, you can always take an observable and turn it into a promise. Uh, so there's a two promise that it will basically take an observable and, and, and return a, a promise. I would encourage you not to do that because observables are way, way more powerful than promises. Um, so with that said, uh, let's talk next about subjects. So there's a class called subject. Uh, this class subject extends the observable class. And it basically has a bunch of different behaviors that we're going to explore here in the next couple of minutes. Um, the nice thing about this is, as you saw previously in our observable, when I have access to the observer, I can next values down the chain. But in Angular, if Angular gives you an observable, you can actually next onto it because you don't have the ability to do that. Angular is the one that's basically sending the values down to you, right? But with a subject, we actually now, we can uh, emit next notifications ourselves and we get some additional uh, functionality with a subject. So again, this is a class that extends observable. So let's look at a couple of different examples of subjects. All right, so let's just walk through this code real quick. Uh, first thing we're going to do here is we're going to import the subject and import that class from RxJS. We're going to go ahead and create a new subject. I'm going to instantiate that, and I don't have to give it anything. Um, subjects by default, just you just new it up. 
I'm going to say this subject emits next notifications that are of type number. So that's the generic specif uh, generic type right here that I'm specifying. And then I'm going to do a couple of things here. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to subscribe here. And you can see here that I'm, I'm, uh, I've got a function that's going to be called for all of those notification types, that next error and completion notification, right? And in this first subscription, so I'm going to subscribe to that subject and say, hey, I, I'm listening. I'm going to say, every time I get a notification, I'm going to say before one and the value. And then I'm going to create another subscription. Because right in the observer design pattern, I can have multiple subscribers, right? So it's kind of like a broadcast, if you will, right? So I'm going to subscribe again. So on that subject, I'm going to invoke the subscribe method. That subscribe method is at the observable level. So again, you know, we're using inheritance. So the subject extends observable. So I have that subscribe method available to me. I'm going to go ahead and say before two and next. And then now on the subject, I'm going to emit some notifications, some next values. So I'm going to next one, and then two, and then three. And that's just going to happen like basically instantly, right? I mean, it's going to do it in order, but it's going to be basically instantly. Uh, and then I'm going to subscribe kind of late to the subject. So kind of keep this all in your brain, right? Just like a coder, you got all this state up in your head, right? So I've subscribed twice. Now I've emitted three values, and now I've subscribed again. So this guy came to the party late. Right? So the, they came to the party before it started. Party happened. And then here, this guy walked in. And then a, another final toast. I don't know. Whatever. And so now another value comes down. Right? So now we get a next of four. And then we're going to go ahead and just complete that subscription. So maybe you're wondering, hmm, is this guy going to get one, two, or three? Or is he just going to get four? Any ideas? You ran it. <laughs> All right. Let's look at uh, subject. So let's run that. It basically happens instantaneously. Oh, let me bump this as well for you. Huh? OK. Can we see that? We good in the back? Yeah. So here, here's my before one and two. They get ones, they get twos, they get threes. Before gets one, two, and after only gets the fourth value. Right, because it only started saying, "Hey, I'm only going to subscribe now," and then it only gets future values, right? And that's a very that's like a, the the raw subject class. And we're going to look at a couple different behaviors of the subject, and we're going to see that that's not always the case, right? And so then finally, then we remember we saw that completion. So back to the code, right? I completed the subject. So then once I complete the subject, then all of them get the completion notification, right? Make sense? All right, so keep that kind of in your head. And then what's the next one we're going to look at? Async. Oh, wait, sorry. Async. OK, so this one's pretty similar. So I'm going to create a new async subject. So that's the name of the class that I import. I'm going to go ahead and subscribe. This one is before, right? I'm going to emit three values again. And then I'm going to subscribe late. And this one's after. So before and after. Uh, and then I'm going to complete. So we're going to subscribe before, emit three values, subscribe after, and then complete. And so let's see what happens. So if I save that, you're going to see that the async subject only gets the last value that's emitted in the stream and only upon completion, right? So if I comment out completion, these never receive a value, right? So you could do this for... Um, I wouldn't say necessarily logging. There's a couple instances where you might be like, you know, I only want the last value when the stream is complete. And then maybe I want to tuck that somewhere or do something with it. So that's an async subject. And then we're going to look at a behavior subject. And this one's fun. So a behavior subject is another kind of variation on the subject class. Uh, I'll, just to be clear, all of these variations all extend subject, 
right? So observable is kind of the parent class, and then subject extends that, and then async behavior and replay subject all extend the subject class. So now we're going to create a new behavior subject. And notice here that I'm providing a value in the constructor uh, when I new up that class instance. So we actually give it a seed value. That's the initial value of the behavior subject. Then I'm going to subscribe. I'm going to emit three values, and then I'm going to subscribe late to the subject. So let's take a look at that. So now you can see that here's my seed value. It before gets all three values, but notice, interestingly enough, the late subscription still gets the last value. So remember when we first looked at subject and we had a late subscriber that came to the party late and it didn't get the first three values? Notice that the late subscriber always gets the last value. And that's the reason why you have to have a seed value. So if you don't have a seed value, a late subscription will just get like null or undefined or something, right? So that's the reason for that seed value, right? And so behavior subjects are really, really powerful and very commonly used in Angular. You can use it to keep track of state in your application, where anytime somebody subscribes, you want to get the last value of the state of whatever it is. Well, that's like a dialogue, whether it's open or closed, or whether the user's logged in. Right? If I've got a behavior subject that's like, is user logged in? And it emits a Boolean value, true or false. The user logs in or logs out. I can always subscribe to that behavior subject and know if the user is logged in or not. Right? Because I'm always going to get that last value. And I don't care about all the previous values. I just care about the last value. They logged in right now. Right? And I can do something with that. So, so a lot of times you'll see people talk about like, subject with a service. And what they mean by that is if we have a singleton instance in Angular, that's a singleton service, I can put a behavior subject in that, and then I can use that to track the state of my, uh, whether the user's logged in or any kind of state of my application. Uh, so it's a very powerful subject, very uh, commonly used for this type of implementation. Last one is replay subject. I feel like you could probably guess what's going to happen. I'm going to, in, uh, in this instance, we're going to new up a new replay subject. So I'm going to new up that class. Uh, the type here, the generic type is a number, so that's what it's expecting to be uh, emitted. And then here I'm going to subscribe. I'm going to emit some values, one, two, and three. And then I got a late subscription as well. And, I'll, and then I have, uh, then I complete. And I uncommented. So now by replay, so we would expect before to get one, two, and three, right? Because it subscribed before the values were notified. But notice that after, unlike behavior subject, it doesn't just get the last value, it gets all of the last values, right? And I believe there's a way, I uh, double check me, um, but I think on the replay subject, you can tell it how many actual values to store. Because you might not want it to store like infinite number of values, right? But this is an instance where if you want to always be able to replay everything that was uh, notified in the observable stream, you can use a replay subject to do that. Any questions on subjects before we keep going? All right. OK, so let's recap real quick. We've talked about observables. Uh, what they are, we've talked about subscriptions. We've talked about the three different types of notifications that we get. Uh, we've talked about subjects, which extend observable, and then we've talked about the various subjects that are implemented in the RxJS, the behavior subject, the async subject, and the replay subject. So the last, uh, not last, but we're getting uh, more towards the end here. Uh, and the next thing that we need to talk about is unicast versus multicast, right? And so let's kind of break that down. So each subscribed observer owns an independent execution of the observable. Remember I was talking in the very beginning slide about the code that only gets executed every time uh, an observer subscribes, right? So in unicast, every time somebody subscribes, we're going to run that code, right? In multicast, we're going to run it once, and then we're going to like broadcast out the same thing every time that value is produced. And we'll talk about, we'll look at a, an example of this. Um, a little bit of detail here in case you're interested, but basically a subject can multicast to multiple subscribed observers. 
uh, and we'll look at how you can do that, and ArcsJS provides an ability to do that uh, for us. And so you might be thinking, well, why do I really need to know about this unicast versus multicast thing? And the reason why you need to know about this is uh, a very practical example is an Angular HTTP request. So in the HTTP module in <laughs> Angular, when I subscribe to an observable that creates an HTTP request, right? Let's say I have a component and I have uh, that observable and I subscribe to it via <laughs> dot subscribe or through something like the async pipe. Well, every time I subscribe to it, it's going to actually issue that network request. And I probably don't need to issue the same network request like three times on a page, right? I only want to do it once. So observables are by default are unicast. So in an HTTP request in Angular, if I do dot subscribe, dot subscribe, dot subscribe, it's going to issue three different network requests. The browser is that, or excuse me, Angular is smart enough to see all those come in. It'll actually try to cancel the first two, right? So you'll see canceled, canceled, and then you'll actually see the third one run. Now, for those of you that are kind of have done server side languages, you know that a cancel doesn't actually do anything on the server end, right? The server actually still processes that request. It tries to send it back to the browser and the browser goes, nah, I don't really want it, right? Uh, and so we don't want to do that. And so we can use multicasting if we're going to subscribe multiple times to an observable in Angular to avoid doing multiple network requests. So that gives you kind of a concrete example, hopefully, of unicast versus multicast. So let's take a look at a couple examples. Okay, uh, let's see. So here we are going to create a new observable. And then I'm going to do a console log here that says new subscription created. And we're going to see that. And I got kind of some styling just to make it kind of pop out for us. And then I'm going to increment i. And keep in mind that i is not scoped within the function, right? So i is outside of that function scope, right? And then here in the interval, I'm going to basically just next that value of i uh, every second, every 1,000 milliseconds. In our teardown, I'm going to clear that interval. And then I'm going to subscribe to it twice. So observable.subscribe, I'm going to subscribe to the value. And I'm going to log out first subscription in the value. I'm going to subscribe again. I'm going to log out that second subscription in the value. right? And so that value is going to be whatever i next, which is i. right? And so what's going to happen, in this perhaps may surprise you, but I'm going to subscribe twice. And so the code inside here is going to run twice. So the value of i, you would think perhaps that it's going to be 1 and then 2. But it's not, right? It's going to run that, and it's going to go plus 1. It's going to go i plus plus. It's going to set it to 1. i plus plus is going to set it to 2. 1,000 milliseconds go by, and then both of these are going to get the value 2. And it's just a, a kind of a simple example that I came up with to kind of show you that this code inside the observable, it's actually running every time somebody subscribes. After five milliseconds, we're just going to invoke unsubscribe on the subscription that's returned from the subscribe method, and, and then we're just going to be done. Yeah. So you can see that new, two new subscriptions were created. And then the value is 2 all the way down through, right? Because it creates those. Every time a subscriber subscribes, it's going to run that uh, that code inside there. And it's 2 all the way down through because we subscribe twice. And we have two subscriptions that were created. So now let's look at multicasting. All right, let me walk you through this. It's a little bit different. I've got an alive Boolean that's set to true. Uh, I'm going to create a new observable. We're going to log that out every time. i is still scoped outside the function, so we're going to increment it every time, right? And then I'm going to set an interval, and I'm going to next that value just like we did before. I'm going to use this take while operator, and we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, here in a second. But take while basically says, keep giving me a value while some predicate function returns true. Once this predicate function returns false, it's going to basically unsubscribe from the observable and say, no, I don't want it anymore, right? Hence, like, take while. 
We have to multicast it using a subject. Uh, don't worry too much about this because we're going to get a little bit in the weeds. Just think about this. What we really want to learn about is this idea of multicasting. But I have to use this publish method. This actually returns a class called a connectable observable. Uh, and then I can subscribe to that multicasted observable. And I'm going to go ahead and log out first and second subscription with the values. And then once you actually connect is when the glue kind of comes together. Again, don't worry too much about that. And then after five seconds, we're going to go ahead and toggle alive to false and say, I don't want any more values. Did I do it? Yep. So now you're going to see that only one only inside the observable, that's only run once, right? Because now what's going to happen with multicasting is once the first subscriber kind of subscribes, everybody from there on out, it's like a broadcast. Everybody's just getting the same value that's produced, right? So the value is produced inside that function in the, the, the uh, inside the observable. And we're only going to do that once, right? And so think about that HTTP request that I talked about. If I do an HTTP request to go get the user profile, I don't need to do it every time I subscribe if I'm subscribing multiple times. And you, you may be shocked to actually look in your network panel. If you have multiple async uh, pipes or something like that, you'll see, oh, wow, there's like canceled, canceled, and then there's my request. That's really interesting, right? <clears throat> so what we want to do is we want to use multicasting to basically avoid that. And now anytime somebody subscribes, they're just going to keep getting the same value that's produced by the observable, right? And so that same value is just one in this case. If I subscribe again, if I add a third subscriber, it would also get one. If I added 10 subscribers, they would all get the same value that's produced by the observable. So that's kind of the difference between unicasting and multicasting when it comes to RxJS. Uh, it's kind of important to know just when you're subscribing to things like HTTP client uh, in Angular. Any questions? You guys getting sleepy? It's kind of heady stuff. Everybody following along? Anybody just like, dude, I'm out? You can, if you want to leave, I'm not going to be offended. <laughs> like, seriously, I get that this is kind of like, oh boy, okay. Uh, and you already listened to PWAs. It's a lot. Okay, so the, uh, one of the next things we want to talk about is hot versus cold. So uh, this kind of goes in line with multicasting and unicasting, but observables can be either hot or cold. So a cold observable is when the observable produces the source of the value, so the producer is only when subscribed to. So again, going back to our HTTP request in Angular, if I have a function that does return new, you know, HTTP.get, right, and I uh, have that function and I call whatever it is, like get user, and it returns that new HTTP.get, which returns an observable, right? In Angular, you'll know that if I just do like get user or whatever that function is, it actually doesn't do the network request, right? It doesn't actually produce a value because the HTTP request in Angular is a cold observable. It's only upon subscription that the producer starts producing values. In this case, the producer is the HTTP that's actually going to go out, make that fetch, and then give you the value back asynchronously. Opposite to that is a hot observable. So a hot observable, it doesn't matter how many people are subscribed. Right, So a hot observable closes around an already existing producer. One of the, <laughs> one of the ways I've talked about this a bunch of times is, uh, is actually my wife, whom I love dearly. Let me just preface that with this. Uh, and let's say that my wife is in the kitchen, right? And she's just talking, and I'm in the living room, right? And they're separated by their different, you know, different rooms. I can't hear, right? And she's just in there talking to herself. She's a hot observable, right? I come into the room, I can start getting values, I can hear her. When I leave, she's still talking for whatever reason, right? Whereas a cold observable would be a more sane person, which my wife is very sane, would be once I walk into the kitchen, she's like, oh, I have something to tell you, Brian. I'm glad that you're here. I'm going to start producing values and you're listening to me. And then when I walk out, she's probably, I would hope, stop producing values and be like, oh, okay, well, he left, right? And so I'm done producing values, right? And so that's the difference of a hot observable kind of versus a cold observable, okay? I will preface to say this real quick. I've told my wife that I use this example oftentimes, like if I'm training companies and stuff about hot versus cold observables, and she has no idea what I'm talking about. And she goes, 
well, as long as you say I'm hot, then I don't care. That's fine. <laughs> so, so, so she, she enjoys that I, I get to bring this up every time I talk about it. Um, so cold observables, like I mentioned, you're likely already using them. The HTTP service that we talked about. Subscribing to them more than once will create multiple instances of the producer. We already kind of saw that when we talked about unicasting versus multicasting. And multiple subscriptions to an HTTP observer will produce, will result in multiple HTTP calls to the same endpoint. So watch out for that, like I've already mentioned. So let's look at a uh, cold observable real quick. So, oh, be sure to start the socket IO server. Yep. Uh, server? Thanks, Eric. You got me covered. Okay, so I just got a simple socket IO server that I'm running. We can look at the code if you really want. That's not part of the talk necessarily, uh, but inside here, um, once the user uh, connects, I'm going to log something out. Uh, on the event here, I'm going to log the data. I'm disconnecting. I'm going to set an interval. I'm going to emit a message notification, and it's going to have a message, the hello, plus an ID that I'm auto-incrementing. And where's I defined? Thank you. I's right here. So we should see hello, one, two, three, coming down on a socket server. So that's producing values for us. Okay, so here in this cold observable, it's a cold observable, here I'm going to say a new subscription is created. I've got my URL, my socket, and I'm actually going to create the connection to the socket server. And then every time I receive that message, I'm going to go ahead and uh, issue a next notification down to all my observers, right? To all the people that are subscribed uh, to my observable. And then down here, I'm going to simply subscribe to it. So I'm going to say subscribe to that observable. Every time I receive a message, just go ahead and log it out. Oops. Okay, so we can see that the new observable is created, and we can see here are our values coming down. And if we go to our network tab, and how do I get rid of the console? Right there. Uh, right here I can see here is actually the messages that are coming down. So I can see those values kind of being emitted. I can see that I've connected to my web to my socket server. Uh, but if I go back to the code, and what if we just never subscribe? Well, if we never subscribe, this is just socket IO, but if we never subscribe, that connection to the socket server is never created, right? Because it's a cold observable. It's not until I subscribe that the producer actually starts producing values. So hot observables, we kind of already talked about that. Um, an observable to a sec uh, socket server, like even though I didn't subscribe, uh, it was still producing values, but it's not until the observable didn't actually start like listening and connect. So it was a cold observable. If you're using NGRX, the action stream, I don't, is there anybody in here that's using NGRX? We got a couple of people that are using NGRX. So you know in your effects, you guys are writing effects, right? And you do, you import, uh, inject actions, and then you do like actions dot of type, right? That actions observable, that's emitting actions whether you're subscribed to it or not. Right? So whether you have an effect tied to that actions observable or whatever, actions is constantly, whenever you dispatch an action, those, those are being emitted whether you have any subscribers or a million subscribers to that observable stream. Right? So that's a, an example if you're using NGRX. For those of you that don't know what NGRX is, that's the Redux pattern that Angular has implemented. Um, so React has this thing called Flux, and then they came out with what's called Redux. And so, Angular kind of got inspired by that and said, hey, let's write our own kind of flavor of this, and that's called NGRX. Uh, so we can also use the share operator. So if you have a cold observable, you can kind of turn it into a hot observable using share. There's also the share replay operator, and there's some nuances between the two of those uh, that I won't be going into. 
uh, but you can use the share operator to take a cold observable and make it hot. Okay, so now in this instance, I'm going to go ahead and connect to my, this is kind of the only difference, is I'm going to connect to the socket server outside of the observable. So this is already producing values. It's not until I actually subscribe, right, that uh, once I subscribe, I'm going to get those values that are already being produced. I don't, like this is already hot, right, because the, the producer is outside of the observable. So you could say the observable closes around the producer, right? So here we're going to do multiple subscriptions to that connection. So I'm going to subscribe and do first subscription. Then I think I subscribe again and do a second subscription. And then after six seconds, I'm going to go ahead and unsubscribe from both of those. So if we run this in the browser, so now I can see that here are my values, I've uh, subscribed to them, and now I'm getting both of those values every time that new subscription is created. And I think I have another example. Uh. So I think the difference Eric, you already got this loaded up probably. I think the difference in this case is I'm not creating the connection to the socket server until I subscribe. And so then we should see two connections to the socket server in the, in the console, in the network tab. Yeah, so, so here I'm only going to get a single subscription created and the important part to note about that is I'm also using that share operator down in the bottom on line 24 to multicast those values out. So I have a stupid question. Yeah, that's all right. What's up? If before you subscribe, if the producer is already producing, isn't that causing some sort of an overhead somehow? Yeah, possibly. I mean, if the producer is already producing, you're just not going to get those values until you subscribe. So like, think about our original examples where we had like one, two, three, and four, right? If the producer is already producing and I come to the party late, I'm only going to get those values once I subscribe because the producer is already producing. The important part to note, I think about with cold observables versus hot observables is whether like you have to subscribe to start producing values. Right, so like the HTTP client, you have to subscribe before it starts producing values. If you don't subscribe, it's never going to make the network request. Whereas a hot observable, it doesn't matter whether there's zero subscribers or 500. It's, it's off just producing values. And it's just kind of ready to go. That's why the, I guess the term hot, right? I mean, it's already like, it's like the coffee. It's already hot and ready to go, you know? Um, but is there like kind of a, there's usually like an instance of, I mean, the reason why you would have a hot observable is because you want to be producing values, uh, like maybe like a chat service or something. I don't know if this is a great example, but like a chat service, um, you know, once I open the app, like values have already been produced, right? Uh, so that's a hot observable because it's not like as soon as I come into the chat client, then the values get produced. People have already been talking all along. Yeah. Okay. You uh, honestly, I don't know if like knowing the difference between hot and cold observables is really critical. Uh, a lot of the stuff we talked about in the beginning with observables and subjects, I think, is really a key takeaway for this talk. But it's important to know that you might run into some instances where you're like, "Oh, I remember Brian was talking about this thing called hot and cold observables. I have to actually subscribe to produce a value, and that would be called a cold observable." And that's pretty much the takeaway. Is like. If it's cold, then you need to subscribe to produce a value. Otherwise, it's just not going to do anything. Okay, uh, finally, we need to talk about unsubscribing. I mentioned this earlier. Uh, we don't want to have memory leaks in our applications. And so to avoid that, we need to unsubscribe from observables. Because uh, once I subscribe, uh, it's going to, you know, it's kind of like a listen event listener, right? It's, it's actively running. 
Uh, and so if we don't unsubscribe in a component, in Angular specifically, if I've got a component <clears throat> and I subscribe to an observable stream, whatever that is, that's producing values, like let's say that chat instance or something, and I've got a little chat component that opens up on my website, and uh, I start a subscription, I say, all right, give me all the values that are coming down, and then the user closes that chat window, and I don't unsubscribe, those values are still coming down, right? And I'm still like, I kind of have this like memory leak running inside my application. So what we want to do is we want to unsubscribe from observables uh, after we subscribe from them. There's a couple of minor caveats specifically to Angular. You do not need to unsubscribe from the act uh, HTTP client or from the activated route observables. So we've been talking a lot about HTTP client. So if I've got a service that returns an observable for the HTTP client and it emits a value, you don't need to worry about unsubscribing from it, right? Because Angular knows that HTTP is inherent in that it only issues a single response. And so once that response comes through, Angular will next the notification down, or if it's an error, give you an error notification, and then it immediately completes. So if you listen to all of those notifications, you'll see next complete, boom, boom, done. And so you don't need to unsubscribe because the observable is already complete. Again, same thing is true for activated route subscriptions, whether you're listening to things like the param map and all, some of the other observables on that class. So how can we deal with these subscriptions? Well, there's a couple different uh, ways to do this. The first and uh, the, the way that you ought to be doing it as much as possible is using this thing called an async pipe. So we have pipes inside of Angular, uh, and you're going to use that async pipe to basically unwrap. I've heard people kind of say that term, unwrap an observable. Uh, so you use that async pipe because Angular will subscribe to it, and then Angular will automatically know that on the destroy lifecycle method of that component, it'll automatically unsubscribe for you. So if you do the async pipe, you just don't need to worry about it. It's just taken care of for you. You can also manually invoke the unsubscribe method on the subscription class that gets returned when you subscribe. We saw that a bunch of times in the demo. And then finally, you can also use these two operators, take while and take until. Uh, I enjoy using those. I think it's a nice way to do it because it's all inside of my pipe. Uh, and I got a couple examples where I'm going to show you that. <coughs> the last thing you can use is an open source project by a gentleman by the name of Ward Bell who's got this project called Subsync. You can look that up on NPM, JS, and it's a little bit of syntactic sugar around dealing with subscriptions and unsubscribing uh, if you don't want to use these other approaches. So we'll take a look at these last two demos. Uh, get back over to code. Let's close that out, close that out. Let's take a look at take while. Okay, so in this instance, you're going to say, first of all, while Brian, that looks a lot shorter, thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to create a new instance of observable. On the observable class, there's a static method called interval, and I can actually create an interval. It just returns an incrementing value from zero up uh, incrementing integer uh, every 1,000 milliseconds. I'm going to set alive to true, and I'm going to take while. We saw this a little bit earlier, so just to kind of recap this. So on the observable, before I subscribe on the observable class, I have this method called pipe, and inside that pipe is where I can pipe the notifications to operators. And we talked in the very beginning about like the 100 plus operators, and so one of those operators is take while. And that's going to accept a predicate function and I'm going to say, go ahead and keep taking values, keep taking those values while this is true, right? And I'm going to log those out. And then after 6,000 milliseconds, I'm just going to set a timeout and I'm going to toggle live to false. We kind of saw this already. So this should be uh, pretty obvious to us. We should see here's the values coming in, incrementing every second. After six seconds, there it goes, we're done, we're finished. Uh, I don't want any more values. And so I've unsubscribed from that observable using take while. I can also use take until. Take until works really well uh, with uh, Angular because Angular has this thing called lifecycle methods and we have a lifecycle method called ng on destroy that gets invoked when the component is destroyed. So in that destroy function, we can actually use a, bit, a subject and next on that subject and unsubscribe from observables using take until. Uh, and you can, go, if you just Googled like take until, uh, unsubscribe, you can see some examples specific to Angular. This is not. Uh, so here I'm going to create that same observable every thousand uh, milliseconds. 
and inside my pipe, I'm going to just filter this and I'm going to say the value is greater than 2 and it's uh, divisible by uh, mod, if it's mod 2 equals 0, so if it's even, right? Yeah. So if it's even and if it's greater than 2, then I'm going to, I'm basically using the filter operator and so I'm going to unsubscribe when the value is greater than 2 and even. And so this is my unsubscribe, right? Uh, and so here on the observable up here that's emitting every second, I'm going to take until and I just pass it unsubscribe. So take until accepts an observable. And once that observable emits a next notification, it unsubscribes. And so if you remember earlier, I was talking about the ng on destroy. In ng on destroy, we could have a behavior, or excuse me, a subject. And I could just do subject.next inside of ng on destroy. And then on that subject, I can use that every time inside of a take until uh, operator. And then all, as soon as ng on destroy is, is uh, invoked, all of those subscriptions are all completed or unsubscribed at that time. So in this instance, uh, once the value is greater than 2 and even, then we should see that it uh, unsubscribes via this other observable called unsubscribe. So here's take until we get 0, 1, it's 2 greater than we should get, and then it hits 4, and we're done. Right? So you can use it uh, a different, and rather than take while, you can use take until with a subject with Angular, but then if you're not using Angular, you can use this when you kind of have dependent, and you're saying, well, when this thing emits a value, I'm done with this other thing. Right? And so that's where you could take, uh, use the take until Does operator. Take until unsubscribe the notification subscription, so you don't have to then. Yeah, it unsubscribes. Yeah. Right? Uh, and so it unsubscribes that particular subscription, but an observable can have multiple subscribers. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the observable is complete yet, though, right? Because you could still have other subscribers and it's still giving them values, but they've unsubscribed over here. All right, with that, you have got the basics on RxJS and you're ready to go out and conquer the world. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. <laughs>